Dennis, thank you for uh, leading us this afternoon and uh, thank you to everybody who participated so meaningfully. Uh, thank you to uh, Lily for the beautiful time of intercession, uh, for uh, Zareen for the song that she sang and especially for the time of worship that we enjoyed, uh, Dennis. And it was all so very meaningful and tied into, I think, hopefully what we are going to discuss this afternoon. So I'm going to share my screen as usual. I have a few slides that I... As we meditate on the topic broken and spilled. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can. And I hope yeah, can, we can. And I hope you can hear me clearly. Crystal clear. Thank you. All right. So before we uh, start looking at uh, what we want to learn today, this afternoon, I want to, I will, I'm wondering whether any of you have or have had any questions when you participate in communion, uh, when you go to the table or uh, during the prayers, have anybody ha had any questions? Uh, and uh, I'm going to share a few questions that I've had, but before that, I thought it will be interesting to ask um, all of you whether you've had any questions, and maybe you can share some of those questions uh, with the group, uh, and that will help us find answers today. Uh, so if you have had any questions at all, uh, it doesn't matter how uh, uh, plain or how uh, silly they may seem, uh, please feel free uh, unmute and tell us what those questions are. The, the, the questions may not have answers, but just if you've had any questions, uh, would you like to share them? Anybody? Yeah, I'd like to share something. I started attending church maybe when I was in class five or six. My mother would force us to go to Sunday school to learn English. And uh, after a while, I started attending the evening service and sometimes a morning service. And I was always puzzled that when it came to this communion time, the first Sunday of every month, the children were shepherded out of the church and uh, the adults had their own you know, session inside. So I still want to know why children are not allowed to sit inside the church when communion is being served. That's, that's, in fact, a very, very good question. And I think many of us, when we were young, have had exactly the same question. Uh, why are we not allowed to participate in that part of the service? Right? I'm sure you'll all agree. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for being so honest. Uh, any, anybody else? Maybe a couple of more people who have had questions. I always used to wonder, like uh, churches, no, in our union church, no, we have communion week after week. Uh, more than three decades we are in the church, and uh, whenever we attend service, we are never missed a communion. But when now I'm from past two years in Bangalore, I see like churches here they have one uh, once in a month. Uh, so I always wonder, no which is right to have week after week or every month, you know, they have first week, some people have fortnight. I don't know. So I always have this question, you know, why there is so, you know, like, you know, what is the right thing, you know, whether to have week after week or like, it is okay, like monthly ones, you know, a special communion service. This was my, you know, doubt always. Another excellent question, I think. And I think yes. this is also uh, in, something that we all have asked at some point in time in the past. Uh, and especially if, if the practice is something in our own church and then we visit a different church and the practice is different, especially with respect to frequency. Uh, 
of communion? I think that's also a very good question. Yes. Thank you, JC. Actually, in a CSI uh, prayer book, it says, do it as often you can. That's why in a CSI churches, they're doing it every week. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Uh, and yes, uh, I, I actually have not prepared answers for these two questions specifically, but um, I, I think we should definitely answer these questions. And uh, in case I forget, uh, and I kind of get uh, caught up in you know, what I have prepared, uh, it, somebody please remind me that we have not answered these questions at the end. I hope I will remember, but in case I forget, uh, please do, uh, do not hesitate to remind me. All right. So over the last three or four months, um, in fact, I think since around April, I have been having a few questions myself, right? Uh, every time I go to the altar, uh, and in our church, we have communion two Sundays every month, the first and the third Sunday. And, uh, you know, I've asked myself questions like, what does communion really mean to me? Uh, and uh, what am I really doing when I kneel at the altar? And another question I've been asking myself is, what is really happening when I, you know, eat the communion wafer? Uh, in our church, we have, you know, the unleavened wafers and drink the concentrated grape juice. We don't serve wine, but we serve grape juice in our church. Uh, so what is really happening when I, when I eat the, the wafer and when I drink that, you know, little bit of grape juice? And um, this is something I've been constantly, uh, you know, asking myself. It's been in my mind every Sunday at least. And uh, when Uncle Tom asked me if I could speak today, uh, incidentally, he's away in Kotagiri uh, at a mission retreat, the St. Andrew's Church uh, in Chennai. I think their mission team has an annual retreat and he is speaking at the retreat. So when he asked me if I could share this Sunday, I thought this would be a great opportunity for me to find answers to these questions uh, and also share them with you. And, uh, you know, like you know, I'm sure you have similar questions or other questions. And I'm, I'm, I was hoping that this would be a good time where we would share and answer these questions for each other. Now, compared with other faiths, and I think you can take all other faiths, um, Christianity is relatively free from rituals. I'm sure you'd all agree with me. Not only do we have almost no rituals, uh, but worshippers, as worshippers, we also have a lot of liberty in the usage of liturgy during worship. And we can see that. We have churches which are very formal in the usage of liturgy, like the Anglican tradition, and churches which are a lot less formal, like those in the Methodist tradition or uh, even the charismatic traditions. So we have a lot of freedom in worship. We hardly have any rituals, but communion is possibly the only ritualistic thing that we participate in regularly, right? And uh, as I was looking at resources to kind of help me answer these questions and uh, trying to uh, think about what is God wanting to tell me and you know what, uh, what is possibly God trying to speak to us this Sunday, I'm going to break this message down into four different things. And the first thing that I want to talk about is um, uh, that communion is a physical reminder, right? It's a physical reminder of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. Now, what do we understand from the word sacrifice? Uh, today, I mean, all of us make sacrifices. I mean, uh, we make sacrifices, first of all, for ourselves, right? Uh, does anybody have any examples of sacrifices that we make uh, almost every day? Anybody at all? We sacrifice sleep or a meal in order to finish some work. Exactly. Uh, so we have we make a lot of sacrifices with respect to food, for example, especially um, you know people who have um, who suffer from diabetes or high blood pressure, 
uh, you know, we sacrifice certain types of food. We don't eat those types of food. Uh, so we diet or people who are fitness conscious, uh, you know, uh, we diet uh, in, order, in order that we will have healthy bodies, right? And uh, in order that we don't spend a lot of time and money going to hospitals and visiting doctors. And those of us who are health conscious, we also exercise. So we do, uh, you know, physical workout. We sacrifice time in the day. Uh, to do exercise. Uh, many of us, we pra in India especially, we have the habit of uh, practicing saving. We all save some part of our income uh, so that we sacrifice comforts today so that we will have um, you know, money for in the future, especially when we are retired. Right. So there are many different examples of ways in which we sa make sacrifices for our, our own selves. Uh, in the Bible, there are many examples too. In the Old Testament, for example, uh, during Joseph's time in Egypt, uh, the Pharaoh in Genesis chapter 41, um, he stores food during the seven years of plenty. And that would obviously have meant that they don't consume all that is available. Uh, they put set aside a, a, a very significant portion of the harvest. Instead of consuming it, they store it. They stored it so that they could have food during the seven years of famine. Right. So another good example of a sacrifice. Now, we also make sacrifices for others. Uh, does anybody have any examples of sacrifices that we make for others? Parents make sacrifice for their children. Excellent. That's an excellent example. And, uh, you know, all of us experience that if we when we are when, uh, you know, as children, we experience that we see you know, almost on an everyday basis of sacrifices that parents make for us. And if we have our own children, we know uh, the kind of sacrifices we make for our for the sake of our children, right? It could be careers, it could be um, so many things that we do for them. Uh, another example is possibly the chores that we do at home, right? Especially when men uh, participate in housework, uh, washing vessels, cleaning the house, etc. We make we sacrifice our time to help our spouse or when children do the same for parents. Uh, we also, all of us um, are involved in different ways in charity. We give to the church, we give to missions, we give to the poor, right? We sacrifice our income or our wealth uh, for the sake of others, right? And again, many such examples in the Bible. Another Old Testament example uh, is when Moses' mother uh, sends her baby away uh, floats her baby in the river, uh, hoping that she will be, you know, found by uh, Pharaoh's daughter and will have will have a life in uh, the palace as part of Pharaoh's family. So she sacrificed the relationship she had with her son. She, in fact, sacrificed her son in a way. She gives up that mother-son relationship in order for that Moses will live, right? So that is a miracle that happens, but the miracle happens because of the sacrifices sacrifice of Moses's mother. So today, as we think of communion, so it is a physical reminder for us of the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus uh, did for us, for each one of us on the cross. Uh, now we can see this in John, in the Gospel of John. I just have two verses here. Uh, there are many more that I'm sure you will all know. John chapter 10, verse 11. Uh, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Uh, in John chapter 15, verse 13, Jesus again says, Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for his friends. And um, so as we participate in communion, that this is a reminder of the supreme or the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus did for us on the cross. And sometimes I wonder, right, whenever I see this image of a cross or of Jesus hanging on the cross, right, I wonder, you know, wasn't it enough that Jesus died for us, right? Why did he have to suffer a painful death on the cross of all things? Why could he have not died a less painful death? Uh, in fact, the cross was not the only method of capital punishment practiced by the first century Romans. Uh, in fact, it was a very rare form of punishment reserved only for those who rebelled against the Roman authority so that the Romans could uh, make them uh, serve as a reminder to others 
so that others who are tempted to do the same will you will have that image of somebody hanging on the cross seared in their brains and they would you know think of the cost of trying to go against the roman empire and then get caught and crucified and then they would not do that uh, so it was a very rare form of punishment so you know why did jesus uh, have to hang on the cross and die you know why could he have not died uh, in a in you know a more comfortable death a less painful death even more uh, why did he have to be flogged, right? And we know uh, that Jesus was flogged, in fact, twice uh, because Pilate uh, wanted to not be responsible for punishing uh, an innocent man or for uh, pronouncing capital punishment on an innocent man. Uh, so why did Jesus have to be flogged? Now, the image that you're looking at is the whip that Roman soldiers used to flog people. Now, flogging was, again, a fairly common form of punishment. The Jews themselves practiced flogging as part of uh, their religious punishments, uh, but the Jews would always use a cane for flogging, but the Romans used a whip like this. And in fact, this is a very um, simplistic illustration of the whip that the first century Romans used. So you can see that it has ropes and at the end of these ropes, it has spikes. So sometimes it had spikes, sometimes it had metal hooks, sometimes it had uh, teeth, uh, sharp instruments that when you, uh, when you use the whip against bare flesh, it would actually hang on to the flesh. And then as the whip was pulled away, it would rip the flesh off, right? It was a very excru excruciating form of punishment. And uh, the result would be very bloody. There would be you know, a lot, lot of blood that the person would lose uh, who's being punished by whipping. And uh, the Romans had perfected this almost to an art. And the way they would do that is kind of uh, tie somebody to a post or a stump like this so that they, and rip off their, uh, you know, the clothing from their back so that their back and their flesh would be exposed. Um, and this is a a screen grab from the movie, The Passion of Christ, which I'm sure many of us, if not all of us have seen of how Jesus was being punished. Now I chose a less graphic image uh, because as you, if you remember these scenes, these scenes are very graphic. Uh, and um, you can see that this was the most painful type of punishment. And again, the question I keep asking is why, 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 why was this necessary? Why was such an extreme kind of death necessary? Let's look at Isaiah chapter 53, verse four and five. Many of us know parts of this chapter by heart. Um, and Isaiah here says in verses four and five, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. So the images in, in these verses are very powerful that the Messiah was going to have to bear pain and, and he, he, he would have to suffer and he would have to be physically crushed and there would have to be wounds uh, and we're not, and I, you know, we all know that this is not talking about physical healing, but spiritual healing, but that is coming about by physical damage, physical suffering of the Savior, right? And this prophecy needed to be fulfilled by Jesus. So often we, we see this image very often, right? And this is kind of a sanitized image of Jesus hanging on the cross. But in reality, if there was a photographer there and you could actually see a real picture of Jesus hanging on the cross and what that would have looked like. It would have looked something like this. This is again a picture from the, the movie Passion of the Christ. And it would have looked something like this. I mean, his flesh would have been torn. There would have been more marks and more bleeding than actual skin that you could see. Uh, a really terrible way to die. But this serves as the physical reminder of the suffering that Jesus underwent on the cross. So Jesus' body was broken. And his blood was spilled, possibly almost all his blood was spilled as a reminder of the great cost that had to be paid to remove God's certain judgment on you and me. So when we kneel and, you know, when we open our hands and when we receive the blood, uh, the, the bread, 
uh, in our hands, right? And and when we pick up that piece of bread or the wafer, and when we sip the wine, we imagine Jesus' body that was broken so badly for us and Jesus' blood that was spilled to save us from certain death. The second aspect of communion is that it is a very personal experience. Now, though it is practiced in corporate worship, we don't do, we don't, uh, you know, take a part of communion alone uh, in, in privacy, but we do it uh, together with people in worship. But even we, though we do it that way, the experience is actually very personal. Now, throughout the Torah, uh, especially in the books of uh, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, uh, we read many, many passages uh, about sacrifices. And uh, Jews were required to sacrifice uh, grain uh, or uh, sometimes give money and most often sacrifice animals uh, for their sins. Now, and this is the context, right, in which Jesus came. Jesus came in the context of uh, first century Israel, where this was common practice, this was common knowledge, so that they would understand what it meant for somebody to sacrifice their lives for others. So an animal died on behalf of the person who sacrificed it so that they can avoid God's punishment for the sin that they had committed. Now let's look at 1 Peter 2, 24. Peter says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. So when we think of Jesus hanging on the cross, so we think of the sacrifice. So Jesus was that sacrificial animal, that sacrificial lamb that should have died, right? And that was what happened on the cross. And we need to acknowledge that we didn't earn it. We have done nothing to earn that. And we don't certainly deserve it either, right? So it is a very personal thing. I didn't earn the what Jesus did on the cross for me, and I certainly don't deserve it either. So the word Eucharist that we very often use is derived from the word Eucharistesas, which means giving thanks, right? So as we think of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, uh, as I think of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for me, uh, as I participate in communion, I give thanks for what God through his son Jesus has done on the cross for me. So instead of me being punished for my sins, Jesus took my sins as his own and died in my place. His body was broken and his blood was spilled so that I can escape eternal punishment. The third aspect that we discuss, that we want to discuss, so the first two, that is it's a physical reminder of the suffering uh, that Jesus experienced on the cross and before hanging on the cross. Uh, and it is a very personal thing that we experience of Jesus' sacrifice instead of me paying for my sins, Jesus paid for them. And the third aspect is that it is it, there is a spiritual reality happening uh, when we partake of communion. So communion, as we all know, is a sacrament or a sacrament. And we all know what a sacrament is, right? It's an outward or a material sign that is accompanied by inward or spiritual change. So if we participate in communion and there is only the outward material sign of us partaking or eating the bread that is broken for us or the wine that is consecrated for us, but there is no inward spiritual change, then there is no spiritual reality uh, in communion. So communion is incomplete without that inward spiritual change. Now, in the first century and prior, uh, so the, the, the Jews practiced, like we said, sacrifice, a sacrifice of animals, and they call this Korbanot. Uh, korbanot comes from the word korban, which means something which draws close, right? So the purpose of sacrifice, of animal sacrifice, was to bring people closer to God, right? Uh, among other things. So when we participate in communion, we are in fact being drawn closer to God. Now let's look at the passage that was read to us. John chapter 6, verses 53 to 59. This is a little small, but I hope you can all see it. 
right? And in this passage, John writes, Jesus said to them, now this is happening in the middle of a very complicated discourse. It's happening in Capernaum. Uh, this is way before Jesus started talking about his death. Uh, you know, you know, we know that Jesus shared with his disciples several times that he has, he is going to have to die. Uh, but that comes much later in all the, uh, the, the other three gospels. And in John, very early, Jesus has this discourse. And not only are there disciples, but there are a large number of people listening to Jesus as he talks about this. Now, this is a very interesting passage. And if you have time at home, please do read it. Uh, so we're just going to focus on this part where Jesus is trying to explain to the Jews uh, about the spiritual reality of the sacrifice that he's going to make on the cross. And he says, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, obviously, as his listeners heard him, they are very confused. Uh, they, are, they are taking this in a literal sense. And they are wondering, what is wrong with this man? He is asking us to eat his flesh. Uh, he is asking us to drink his blood. right? And I think if we were there and we were listening to Jesus, we would be equally confused about what Jesus is trying to say. And Jesus often did this, right? He wasn't very black and white. He wasn't very explicit. He didn't always explain what he was going to say. Um, uh, and especially we see that in a lot of the parables that he narrated. And then Jesus continues in verse 54, whoever eats my flesh, and then he's repeating this, these terrible words, and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. And again, he repeats himself, my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh a fourth time and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. So what is happening as Jesus is repeating these words, eat my flesh, drink my blood. That's the only thing that these Jews are hearing. And if you continue to read after uh, verse 59, you will see that this has a terrible effect. Uh, the John says that a lot of his disciples abandon him. They leave him because this teaching was too difficult. They did not understand it. They did not accept it. They did not agree with it, right? And we can understand why. Now, today, with the help of scripture, with the help of the gospels, with the help of the epistles, and you know, so much that we know and understand, it isn't confusing to us. But imagine being a first century Jew and, Jesus, and listening to these words from Jesus. And Jesus goes on to explain uh, in verse 57, just as the living father sent me and I live because of the father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. And in verse 58, finally, there is some clarity. This is the bread that came down from heaven. So now Jesus is actually explaining a little bit. He isn't completely drawing the veil off and he isn't, you know, explaining it in a way that they would understand. But he gives you a peek into what he means by his flesh, right? So he's saying, okay, this is not my physical flesh, but it is the bread that came down from heaven. And it is not even the bread that, so the moment when, when Jesus uses these words, is all of the Jews will think back to the time in Exodus when their ancestors ate manna. So Jesus affirms and he says, your ancestors ate manna and died. So I am not referring, Jesus saying, I'm not referring to the manna that came from heaven, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. So Jesus very clearly is not talking about his physical flesh and his physical blood, right? So in, in, in uh, theological terms, certain people believe in what's called the transubstantiation, which means that when the elements, the bread and the wine are prayed over by the pastor or the priest, the bread and the wine actually transform. They become the flesh and the blood of Jesus, right? That is not what Jesus is saying, right? Jesus is not saying that at all, right? So he is saying, that if you believe in me, right, and if you accept my sacrifice on the cross, only then do you have chance at eternal life, right? And then many times in John, we see Jesus repeating that I am the way, I am the only way, right? And But of course, the first century Jews just did not understand that. So the, the, if we accept the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, right? Then we accept that that is the payment for our sins. And that, and we, in our spirit, we then have to change. There has to be 
the acceptance and also the change in our life. Otherwise, the sacrament of communion loses its complete meaning for us. Finally, as we experience communion ourselves personally, right, as it becomes a physical reminder for us, uh, as we experience it personally, and as we experience physical change, uh, that is not enough, right? Now, this is something that is to be shared with others. Now, when I say shared with others, there are two aspects of sharing. And the first one is clearly defined to us in the word of God. It is the word also that we use communion. Now, this word comes from 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16, where Paul says, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation? Or many other translations use the word communion in the blood of Christ. The bread that we break, is it not a participation or communion in the body of Christ? And this is part of our liturgy, the liturgy of the communion service. So this is communion. This is fellowship. We are doing this together, right? Now, the second aspect or the more important aspect of communion is, or of sharing it with others, is passing it on. Right? So we are called never to forget or to remember forever. And the only way we can do this is by passing it on. And in Luke chapter 22, verses 19 and 20, uh, Jesus repeats this. Right, As, he, as we look at the Last Supper, uh, Luke records in verse 19, And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me, right? And again, Apostle Paul repeats this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, the later part of verse 23 to up to verse 25. Um, he says, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So, this is again part of Jewish tradition, right? Uh, in Exodus 20, 14, uh, we read about how the Jews passed on a particular tradition, right? And this is uh, recorded that God gives this commandment to the Israelites saying, this is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. And this is what uh, God was referring to, the Passover meal. Then you can see they're all fully dressed uh, they're all ready to go. Uh, the, the, the blood of the lamb is on the doorpost and they are eating the Passover meal. And God commands the Israelites, you know, commemorate this day, right? Do this, uh, teach this to your children, teach this to your children's children so that for generations to come, you remember it, you do not forget it. And the Jews faithfully obeyed God as they celebrated the Passover meal and passed on this tradition through the generations. And we can see Jesus was faithful as a Jew through this tradition. He celebrated the Passover meal. Now, we, we only see one recorded instance or the last Passover meal that he celebrated with, the, with his disciples. But from the accounts in the gospel, um, it is very clear when the disciples ask, Lord, I mean, how do you, how, where do you want to celebrate the Passover meal? So Jesus did this too. Uh, he honored the tradition or the commandment that God gave the Jews. So we are called to share this singular and most important truth that we are saved from certain spiritual death and have the possibility of an eternal future with God through the sacrifice of God's own sinless and holy son. So every time, every single time we kneel at the table and participate in communion by eating broken bread and by drinking wine or grape juice, we acknowledge and accept Christ's supreme sacrifice through his broken body and spilled blood for every wrong that we do and for every right that we fail to do that would otherwise drain us, damn us to eternal death. Amen.